Welcome to AP European History with Dr. Borovkin. Today we continue to talk about the French philosophes, the age of reason, and the focus today is on Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, up front, we want to say he is probably the most important, the most misunderstood, and the most difficult, and the most famous. So all of the most. He's also the one who quarreled with everybody and was detested by everybody by the end of his life. So he certainly merits uh, attention. And as we go, I'll try to explain what exactly he disagreed with Olbach and Helvetius and Voltaire and uh, Diderot. They were all his friends at some point, but then he broke with all of them and each of them individually over different issues. So uh, that's just to intrigue you and let's go over his uh, uh, stages of his life and his biography. Uh, he was born in Geneva. He was proudly calling himself the citizen of Geneva. This is a lot because there were only 1,800 citizens uh, out of 26,000 people, people who lived there, which is still a small town. So he was a kind of a privileged aristocracy, if you want, of Geneva, and his father was a, a citizen. They were of Calvinist, obviously, religion. Uh, and uh, in his youth, he... Uh, had a private tutor who he was in love with, uh, and that, in a way, uh, influenced for him for the rest of his life. In, in fact, just going forward, one of his great novels is Eloise, and that's a relationship of a tutor and a teacher. You know, my hunch is that a lot of the ideas that would take decades later that he would express in his novels uh, were partly influenced by his experience uh, as a, as a t student of this teacher who he was in love with and they kept on relationship uh, friends and, and love relationship friends relationship for for many many years afterwards uh, so one other thing that influenced him is his youth is is uh, is this preoccupation with feeling and falling in love and again, you know, people dismiss it thinking, well, everybody falls in love when they're 17. That's normal, but not the way uh, Rousseau did, because it did influence his philosophy. Uh, in other words, uh, when we think of Voltaire, and he had several very important relationships um, that, that, that did affect his personal life, but it did not affect his philosophy, did not affect his uh interpretations of the meaning of life. Uh, with uh, Rousseau, it did. Uh, in fact, one could say Rousseau is the first romantic, the first uh, thinker who we could say is the beginning, not of the age of reason, but the age of romanticism. So again, that goes back to his youth and his falling in love. Uh, now, when he uh, grows up, he, these ideas sort of begin to crystallize and uh, uh, he, he's very poor all his life. He works as an apprentice, and then he goes to France, and then he goes to Paris, and he's introduced to, uh, you know, families uh, of important people through the letters of introduction, and he begins to attend the salons, and this is like 1849-50, and this is when he meets uh, all these people. He becomes friends with Diderot and Grimm, uh, the, the writer Grimm, and, and through them, he gets to know, uh, he gets to, to, to meet Helvetius and Olba. And in the, there's this period of time when they're all friends. They all are members of this uh, salon of philosophes and, and, and writing various things, discussing their novels, discussing their uh, plays, uh, and, and in case of Voltaire, and, and so on. Uh, a, a very important point comes in, in uh, uh, 1752. So this is, he's a young man, he's in Paris, and this is the time when he's friends with everybody, uh, belongs to the group of philosophers. And then there's a, um, a competition is announced to write the essay uh, on the uh, nature and inequality of men. So there's a, I don't remember exactly who it was, some city announced the competition for the best essay on the topic of nature and inequality of men. And so Rousseau writes this uh, essay, and this actually what launches him on a 
career of being a philosopher, a philosopher, and as we shall see, the most famous one and the most revered one. So uh, it was an instant success and he won the best prize and he became immediately known all over Paris. And then later on, it was translated in other languages and it went to Germany and to England and to Russia. Uh, and uh, it, it meant in a big hit, like a literary hit, uh, like today hit uh, music. So what did he write? He uh, expressed a whole lot of ideas that later on will be repeated by others. And among them, Adam Smith, Karl Marx, Proudhon, uh, Tolstoy, uh, Russian uh, writer, Bakunin, the, the uh, uh, future author of anarchism, and all kinds of others. Not, he was obviously not an anarchist. What did he say? Well, he basically said that men are born uh, unequal physically. Some are more talented, some less. Some have these qualities, others have less. Uh, but uh, the physical difference is not what's important. But economic, political, social, and moral are differences not of nature. In other words, they are a product of what Rousseau calls civilization. Now, in today's uh, uh, vocabulary, we wouldn't use the word civilization for what he meant. We would mean soci socialization. And that is the way people are brought up, the way they are educated. Uh, and uh, the way society makes people, everything we are as persons is not the way we were born. Uh, this is a product of where we grew up and what kind of education. And this is, uh, you know, now it seems so obvious. Everybody knows this. Socialization is in all courses of political science and sociology. But that was a breakthrough to say that uh, people are born perhaps with physical differences and abilities, but... Uh, the way they become is a product of socialization as society, but he calls it civilization. In other words, it, from here steps his most important thesis that he was going to elaborate throughout his life. Civilization corrupts men. In other words, all men are born equal, as he would say later, but they are in chains. In other words, the way the society treats people is making them worse. This is the key thing. And from here, he goes to even a more uh, a proposition that would be taken up in arms and protest. The progress, what we call progress, he say, is not progress. Because the only more progress that there can be is moral progress. And the society, the way it is set up, it does not promote moral progress. It does the opposite. It corrupts men. So, for example, if we think of a big city and there's a rural boy from the villages who comes, from the point of view of Rousseau, he is pure, he is simple, he is from the rural setting, doesn't know any of the vices. As soon as he comes to Paris, as soon as he comes to a big city, he is corrupted because there's this competition, because he has to fend for himself, because there is money, because there is a career. Everything that he has to do in a modern city is vice, 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 avarice. It has to be uh, competing with others. He has to grab, he has to deceive, he has to uh, become bad. Uh, this is his key thesis. Civilization makes people bad. Uh, progress is in fact not a progress, but a decay uh, of modern life. So this, of course, is why it was such a big hit uh, through the, um, uh, after the publication. He continues to say that a virtue can be obtained through education. Uh, and this is why, this is, this is, it comes to this conclusion at this early essay, this discourse on nature, and that is going to take him another several years before he crystallizes it into his theory of education that would make him famous to the present day. Now, what's interesting is this, this early statement. He's a young man. He just wrote his first paper that becomes very fashionable, very, very uh, famous. This puts him already in a discord with the philosophs, with uh, Elvetius and Olbach and Voltaire and Diderot and the others. Why? This is why, because these people believe in civilization. They believe 
that natural law and natural reason is going to make people better. In other words, when Rousseau says civilization corrupts people, make them worse, they're kind of like, hey, well, wait a second, what are you talking about? Which civilization? They still agree that education is good and education can make better men. But uh, that they agree on. But what they disagree is that Rousseau thinks this is the only thing that really counts, uh, is moral education. And the so societal change is, is a postscript, is something that happens naturally. Not so for Urbach and Vetius and others who actually want to change political institutions. Uh, they are philosophers who are against the Catholic Church, against the, the king, against the dictatorship of the ruling classes for a kind of a new society based on reason and natural law. Not so with Rousseau, and they have a kind of a cooling off of relationship, but they haven't yet broken up of this. The breakup comes in uh, 1759. Uh, in fact, 1759 to 1762 is the crucial time in the life of uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who would write his most important works in this three years. In fact, uh, especially say that it was actually in one year that he wrote it and they appeared in print at the year next and the year next. But in a sense, you could say everything that Rousseau wrote that was of such tremendous value is written in one year out of all these many years of his life. Uh, the rest of it was elaboration, repetition uh, on these key ideas that he had developed. So, uh, what do, does he break over? Let's go one by one. Uh, the break with Voltaire comes over the theater. As you know, Voltaire is a playwright and he writes plays and he wants to show them to Genevans. Uh, and of course, he has a house in Geneva. It's a really beautiful chateau. He's quite rich. Uh, Rousseau is very poor. He has to always earn money. He doesn't live like Helvetius is rich, Orbach is rich, Voltaire is rich. Rousseau is poor. He is earning money by translating or writing music notes, uh, copying, essentially, working as a photocopy machine, copying music notes. That's how he earns his money. Uh, uh, very, very poor. So in any case, uh, why is uh, Rousseau against theater? He is against theater, partly that comes from his Calvinism, because he believes that theater corrupts men. Because in theater, what do you have? You have adultery, you have wicked people, you have murder, you have all kinds of things that are bad for you. I mean, theater makes people bad. It does not cultivate virtue, and therefore he's against the theater. Now, Voltaire would object and say, no, I'm not promoting violence, but violence is a part of life, and you have to show it in the drama of life in the theater. Well, that's the disagreement, and they... Uh, they, they break it because he actually does uh, you know, encourage authorities in Geneva to not allow Voltaire to have his theater. So it's a, it's a political argument. And he does have uh, an upper hand in this one because obviously uh, the Calvinist establishment of Geneva agrees with him. Uh, he breaks with Diderot and with Grimm over small issues that come today as small as some kind of intrigue about women and about who likes whom and about all these sort of innuendo and guesses and who said what about whom. It's it, trivial stuff. It's, it's not important, but it does lead to serious damage to their relationship, bringing them to almost an enemy like, especially with Grimm uh, and with Diderot. Uh, and it sort of breaks uh, the circle of friends into uh, strangers, which would be exacerbated by their political differences. Uh, finally, uh, well, not finally, but the, he does write his most important work, one of two most important, which is a novel that is called Nouvelle Eloise, 1762. Uh, so this is a novel that's not a political treatise on the nature or l'esprit or, or of laws or whatever. It is a story. It is a novel, and a lot of it is dialogue. It is, in a sense, like a theater, and this is why it's so paradoxical. He, uh, uh, you know, opposes Voltaire over theater, but he does 
write something that's like a theater. The difference is, he would say, is that he's cultivating virtue there. Uh, this is what he thinks he's doing. So let me explain what is such a big deal about Novelle Eloise. It's a triangle. It's a very trivial story. You basically have uh, a young girl, Julie, and her mother hires a, a, a tutor. And the tutor is a couple of years young, uh, older than she is. She's 17, he's 19. Uh, as uh, critics say, you know, the mother was quite silly to doing that because you could predict that they're going to fall in love. And if you have a 17-year-old boy who is uh, teaching a 16-year-old girl, I mean, what do you expect? They are going to fall in love. I mean, chances are that they're going to discover their senses and their thoughts and feelings and would fall in love. So they do. Uh, but not just fall in love. You see, usually in the spirit of the times, they fall in love and they get married and live happily thereafter. No, that, that's, that would not have been something that was such a big hit if it was like that. They fall in love and they make love. Uh, and this was forbidden. They're not married. So he's the first one to write about sex, about unmarried boy and girl falling in love and having sexual relationship. Now, the mother finds out uh, and she wants to get her married as soon as possible to a decent man so that there's no shame. And he does. Uh, she does find one. And she, uh, Julie gets married to a man who is very decent, very proper, very noble, very nice. I mean, he's just perfect, ideal uh, kind of man. His name is Volmar, and he's Russian. So this is kind of nice that he created this positive uh, character of a very, very noble man who, who, who knows the truth. He knows about her relationship with uh, Pierre, uh, with Saint Preux, Saint Preux, his name is, uh, and he's okay with it. It's, as long as it's over, as long as she, she stays decent and proper and all that, uh, and then they, um, and he doesn't send him away. He kind of feels that you have to control your passions, you have to be able to live together in the same uh, neighborhood or, or whatever. Uh, so, um, but uh, poor Julie, she keeps thinking, she lives with uh, Volmar, but she keeps dreaming about her lover, about her tutor. Uh, and this, of course, I think it has to do with Jean-Jacques' uh, memories of his own youth, when he was totally infatuated with his teacher and kept thinking about her no matter where he went and who else he dated with. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, in the end, uh, there's no resolution except that uh, you, you have to control your passions and you have to uh, ad admit that that's who you are and that's what you want and you have to live with them uh, and manage it in a decent sort of way. Now, it's, it's not, I mean, today it seems like a, such a simple short story, big deal. You know, a boy and a girl fall in love and then she gets married. I mean, that was repeated over and over zillions of times in later. Why was this such a success? It was an immense success. This is the only time he made money because several editions were sold out and sold out and sold out. And it was like a hit. It was translated to German and to English and to Russian as unbelievable success. Why? Well, this is why. First of all, my explanation because a lot of women recognize themselves in it. Because he is for the first time to write about passion. About passion. I mean, look, he's saying they acted on their love. They acted on their feelings. Now remember, at that time, marriage had nothing to do with the feeling. Your father told you who to marry, and then you married, and then you had a lover on the side, and there was no happiness. There was... There was uh, essentially cynicism and immorality, uh, and especially in the French uh, capital, and especially in the royal court, and especially with these official and unofficial lovers uh, that the, the aristocracy, including the king, took one after another. I mean, this is a time of really uh, immorality when the king slept with those four sisters at the same time. Uh, so when it comes a kind of a pure love of two innocent souls, a boy and a girl, 
who are trying to find their way in life through passion, this is like big success immediately. Eloise becomes uh, a most popular novel of 18th century. Moreover, it introduces a new fashion. It introduces a new fashion that it's okay to be in love. I mean, it sounds so obvious today, but it was not so obvious then. It's just, you follow your feelings, you find uh, the one you love and uh, let it go, uh, free reign of your passions. This was totally new, and this is why he's so different from other philosophers. In fact, if he had finished his career writing just Nouvelle Eloise, he would not be known as a philosopher. If he had died that, ne that year, he would be known as a first romantic writer, and that would have been it. But it was so happened that next year, he, wrote, he writes another big hit of his that is perhaps even more well known and, and the one that gave him uh, the honor of being the chief among all the philosophers. And this is what he writes. It's called Du Contrat Social ou Principe du Droit Politique. In English, The Social Contract. It's a very small book published in 1762. And it is... Um, something we're going to talk about in a minute and now uh, in, a, in the next segment because now my dear boys and girls that I excited your fascination with pure love and with the contract social I'm going to ask you to tell all your friends to put your likes and spread the word with wonderful lectures Dr. Brofkin gives us on European history uh, with Dr. Brofkin thank you <laughs>